Thank you for the intro, Ben. So I want to start by just uh, submitting a patch to my slides because, yeah, I was actually submitted the talk last year, but since then I've done 15 more challenges, so that, that needed an update. And the other one is that today I have a special guest with me, which is the imposter syndrome. And this is because this is my first talk at a Rust conference. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my journey with Rust. So you, you will understand why I have a little bit of pressure right now. OK, before getting started, I want to share the slides with you. I'm going to be showing a few code examples. So maybe if there is something that catches your attention, you will have the slides ready for checking them out later. And while you scan the QR code or check out that link, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. So hello, everyone. My name is Luciano. I am an AWS Serverless Hero, Certified AWS Solution Architect, and also an MVP. This might not be very relevant to you, but I am the co-author of this book called Node.js Design Patterns. So if you are in the Node.js ecosystem, chances are that you might have seen this book. And if you did, please let me know what you think about that. If you don't care, sorry for the unnecessary advertisement. <laughs> I work for a company called Fortiorem as a senior architect, and you can find me on pretty much everywhere, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, GitHub. So feel free to connect. Don't be shy. I would love to talk more with you after this conference. Now, a little bit about Fortiorem, the company that I work for. We are effectively a consulting company. We are focused on cloud and AWS. What we do is basically we help other companies to either go to the cloud, so lots of cloud migrations, or if they are already in the cloud, optimizing their deployments, optimizing for cost, building new products, and all that kind of things. So if that's something that interests you, maybe your company needs help with AWS, let me know. I'm definitely more than happy to chat about that. And we are also starting to explore Rust a little bit. Uh, myself and Owen Shanahi, who is the CTO of Fortiorem, we do a weekly podcast about AWS, and we recently published this episode uh, where we talk about the experience of writing a Lambda in Rust. So if that's something that interests you, check it out and let me know what you think. Okay, why am I learning Rust? Because definitely not an expert here. I am still very early in the learning journey, so keep that in mind in case I say something that is not absolutely accurate. Uh, so I'm a full stack web developer by trade. This is what I've done for most of my career. And I'm becoming more and more of a cloud architect in the last five years. I still have this kind of hybrid role where I do a lot of architecture, but also I'm very hands-on in implementing the solutions. Uh, I have a lot of experience with dynamic scripting languages, mostly JavaScript and Node.js, but I've also done a good fair share of Python and PHP throughout my career. So I kind of coming to Rust with that perspective of higher level uh, interpreted scripting languages. I have been using Go for some uh, performance sensitive applications. And I actually really like how easy it was to get started with Go, but I felt it was ab still abstracting a lot of things. So. Rust seemed like the natural natural next step for me to keep exploring these topics. Like, when do you need performance? When do you need to kind of go a little bit lower level and really optimize things for the CPU, for the specific thing you are trying to build? I think Rust is a great fit there, and I have been enjoying learning it so far. OK, but it didn't start really well, if I have to be fair. Like, this is more or less how my journey started. I was getting all the usual errors like, oh, you're trying to use this variable that you just moved. And I was like, what does this mean? I can do this in any other programming language I know. Why Rust doesn't allow me to do that? And of course, I kept studying, and I started to actually learn all the principles of Rust and appreciate why they are there and why they are actually meant to protect my code and help me to write better code. And it started to be a lot better. And I think now I'm starting to be a lot more fluent with the language. Now, it's not, I'm not there yet. This is probably me most of the time when I'm looking at more complicated function signature and traits and generics. Sometimes I still get very confused and I spend a lot of time trying to make sense of the syntax. And a little bit more practically, I started by trying to port some of JavaScript code that I wrote before into Rust. And actually, I didn't really finish that project because at some point I pivoted into something else. I was trying to build a brute force cracker for JWT tokens. And I ended up actually building in Rust something that is effectively a way to quickly explore the content of a JWT token on the CLI. So if you just grab a JWT token, you can run the CLI, and it's going to show you the JSON payload. And this was effectively my first project in Rust that I published. 
Uh, then I started to do live streaming on Twitch about trying to solve advent of code, and this is mostly what we are going to be talking about today. And also some other small side projects, like I did some small games with Bevy, some small libraries, and other coding challenges. But unfortunately, nothing production ready as of today. I'm looking forward to be able to do something production ready or to have a project where I can actually start to use Rust in production to learn exactly what happens after you put your code in production when you need to do bug fixes, when you need to build new features and support the deployments and all that kind of stuff. Um, I am really excited about Rust on AWS, especially with Lambda. I think there is a huge potential there. I haven't seen too many use cases, but it's starting to keep up. So I expect that throughout this year, we will see a lot more of that. And hopefully, I'll be doing something about that as well. Now, one thing that I want to mention is that for me today is not really about tech. It's a lot more about people. And I'm really happy that that was emphasized a lot during the keynote. And I want to say thank you specifically to six people, which are here in this slide. They helped me a lot throughout my learning journey in Rust. As many people say, it's not very easy to get started with Rust. And of course, I was feeling that kind of difficulty as well. But learning Rust with these six amazing people is something that helped me a lot. And I, I want to mention specifically uh, Roberto, who you can find on Twitter as GB Inside. We are doing the Twitch streams together. And he's doing a lot of amazing visualizations about the, the challenges that Advent of Code gives you. So if this is something that you really like to see, it's actually quite, quite engaging, you, you should check out his Twitter profile. And I would like to ask you to join me to give a round of applause to the Rust community as a whole. Thank you, because I, I, I truly believe that it is, it is a really welcoming community, and I'm really glad that I had the chance to be here today. I was actually able to meet a lot of these people in person, and it has been amazing for me. So my first hot take of this talk is if you are struggling to learn Rust, or if you just want another excuse to get better at it, don't do it alone. Find somebody that wants to do this with you and do that kind of learning journey together, share the, your, that experience, and I'm sure it's going to get much easier and it's going to get much more fun and you will be learning much faster and help each other every time that you find some kind of blocker. Okay, let's get into Advent of Code. So Advent of Code is a coding challenge that happens every year in the Christmas period. And it's generally you get like a, a challenge every day. So every morning you go in the website and you check what's the challenge of the day. And I have all my solutions in this repository if you want to check it out later. And I'm going to be referencing some of the code from that repository. But what does a challenge look like? It's effectively a programming puzzle that you need to solve. And it's built in a way that is very engaging. Every year there is kind of a story where you are somebody that needs to save Christmas by solving this kind of coding challenges. So every day you, are, you have some kind of obstacle that you need to face, and you can face that by finding a programming solution to that particular problem. And you read all this text, you understand the story, there are some examples of the kind of challenge that you need to, to address. And then at the end you have that te text box, which is basically you can find the solution in whatever way you want, whatever language, whatever tool. Eventually, I want you to give me the answer to this problem. And you start by looking at an input file. So every challenge will have some kind of text input that you need to process. So generally, every day what you do, you read the challenge, you understand the puzzle, you write some code to parse the input. Then you have to figure out some kind of algorithm that gives you that, that particular solution. When you think you found the solution, then you have to submit your solution in that text box, and that will unlock part two. So every day, it's actually two challenges, because there is a part one and a part two. Part one is generally a little bit simpler. It's kind of a warm up, just to understand the, the kind of problem you're working with. And then part two is generally either a variation of the problem, or sometimes it's just performance sensitive, like maybe your solution for part one can be brute forced, and it's not an ideal solution. Part two is going to push you to actually figure out a solution that it's actually a proper algorithm. You cannot brute force that particular scale of the problem. So um, generally, you end up repeating all the steps for part two, and eventually you have the full solution for that particular day. Now, the first 
topic that I want to cover today, and which is the thing that I, I've been enjoying the most about Rust in combination with Advent of Code, is iterator combinators. And I want to show you a very specific exercise, which is day one of 2022, so last year. Actually, a lot of people have seen, they, they've written articles of the live streams or YouTube videos about this one. And I think it's actually a very easy one to, to grasp, and I'm gonna try to use that one as an example. So basically, if we look at the input, we have a bunch of numbers, one by line, and every once in a while we have an empty line, which is basically defining groups of, or batches of input. So what we need to do in this particular problem, without going into the full story, is basically take every single batch, sum the value, so all the values will give you a, a new value, and you do that for every single batch, and you basically end up with a new list of numbers. So every number is coming from a very specific batch in the input. At this point, you take all the new list, all the numbers in the new list, and you have to take the max value, and that's basically the answer to the problem. So it's just a very simple data processing pipeline. So uh, this is basically gonna be the answer for this particular input. So my first solution was actually quite simple and very imperative, just two nested for loops. I was doing all the bookkeeping manually, allocating max, starting to split the batches for every batch, read all the lines, figure out what's the total for this batch, do all the bookkeeping again by summing all the numbers manually, and finally, every time you find a new value, you have to check, is this the new maximum? If it is, let's swap it, and at the end of the two loops, you have the maximum value. So this is, of course, very simple. You can probably write this in any other language, but of course didn't feel very uh, idiomatic in Rust, so to speak. So I started to look, how can I rewrite this using iterator combinators? And it was actually quite simple and eventually I think it was quite nice to, to read this code. And if you never use iterator combinators, it's basically a way to build um, pipelines using iterators. So in this particular case, we start from the input, which, which is just a, a string slice. We use split, which basically creates an iterator that is gonna give us um, items every time we find that particular delimiter, in this case, the empty line. Then by using map, we are saying for every item coming in this iterator pipeline, I want to somehow transform that value into something else. And here, what I'm doing, I'm actually nesting iterator combinators to say, okay, this is a batch, process the batch still using iterator combinators. So for every line, do another map, map every line as a number, and at the end you can call dot sum to basically trigger, um, um, to consume the entire iterator and convert it into a single value, which is the sum of all the values in that iterator. So this is gonna happen for every batch, and then once we complete all the batches, we just need to get the maximum value, and of course we need to unwrap because if the list is empty, there is not gonna be any value, so this is an optional, and we will need to extrapolate the value. Now keep in mind that here I'm using unwrap a lot, just because in advent of code you know the input, and it's a little bit safer to do that. I wouldn't recommend people to do that in production, so every time you see unwrap, just give me the benefit of the doubt, but don't, don't copy that, that attitude. Okay, so the, the interesting thing to mention here before I move on is that when you use iterator combinators, you have generally two types of combinators. The ones that are just, uh, let's say, increasing or extending that pipeline by adding more steps, but they are somewhat lazy, like they, they don't consume your iterator. And the other ones that are actually consuming the iterator and giving you an actual value. For instance, here I'm using sum, which does that, or max, which does that. But until I call sum or max, nothing happens. So this is an interesting thing coming from JavaScript to see that iterator combinators are lazy. In JavaScript, when you use filter or map, they actually consume the entire value that you're starting from immediately. So it's interesting there, and this is something that can help you a lot with performance. Then when I did this, also because again, I'm coming from JavaScript, I started to wonder, okay, I really like the functional approach with iterator combinators, but how much performance am I compromising for that? So I did a quick benchmark, and I'm not too sure about the quality of this benchmark, so feel free to double check, but the result was basically uh, quite overwhelming because the um, functional approach is just slightly slower than the more imperative approach, 
and I, I'm quite sure that I'm missing something obvious there. I'm quite sure that in Rust you can actually bring it on par with the other approach. So if you know any trick or maybe something I missed, definitely let me know. But this was more than enough for me to be confident to say, every time I use iterator combinators, I'm not really compromising on performance, which is really great. Then the second question I had is like, okay, these iterator combinators look great, but I'm sure that there will be a lot of problems where I'm not gonna have enough flexibility to solve the problem that way. So to, to try to answer this concern, let's look at the part two of this particular problem. It's almost very similar. The only difference is that when we get the list of some chunks, rather than just getting the max, this time we want to get the top three numbers. So we want to do like a max three kind of thing. And then once we have these three numbers here, the result of the problem is going to be to sum them, and this is gonna be the answer we have to give to the, to the problem. So it's just a slightly more complicated processing pipeline, but it's still a very simple exercise to do. So how do we solve this? And using iterator combinators, this was pretty much the first thing that I tried. Almost everything is the same, except now I'm calling this function called sort descending. Then I can use this other one called take tree, which actually allows me to stop the iterator after three items. And then finally I can call sum. And I was like, this looks pretty good, except that Rust started to yell at me and say, what the hell is this function? I have no idea what this is. And of course this is because this iterator combinator doesn't exist, unfortunately. So I started to look around and this was the case where I was saying, okay, this is not flexible enough, what do I do? And I found this crate called Iter Tools, which is a crate that I'm seeing a lot of people use for advent of code because it conveniently gives you a lot more iterator combinators and they will probably be enough for most of the use cases. So by having Iter Tools, what you can do is once you import the library in your code, you get new functions that you can use as iterator combinators. And in, in this particular case, I have the ability to call this function called sorted, which is basically gonna consume the iterator and sort the resulting list. But it's gonna sort them ascending, so I also want to reverse that order because I'm looking for the uh, top values. So I'm, I can use this other iterator called rev, which is gonna reverse the, the, the iteration at that point. And then I can use take three and sum, but the interesting thing here is that this sorted method is not in the core, but it's something that we got through a library. So that's interesting because it kind of shows that these combinators are somewhat extensible if you bump into a very specific uh, case where the other iterators are not gonna help you. Okay, the next question that I had was like, okay, but do we really have to sort? Now, for this particular problem of advent of code, it's probably okay, like the input is still quite small, sorting is probably fine, but it's one of those things that advent of code pushes you to do. It's always pushing you to check your solution and think, okay, is this really the most optimal solution? What if I would have to use this solution with an input that is maybe millions of lines or even billions? Is this actually gonna be efficient enough? Sorting doesn't seem right anymore. So I started to have another idea because I thought, okay, we only look for the top three items. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to sort everything, maybe billions of lines, if you only look for the top three. So another approach could be that you just keep iterating and every time you see a new value, you check it against the current top three values. And if you find a value that it's bigger than the ones that you already have, you just kind of shift things around and you update your top three. And just to visualize that idea, if this is our input, we basically start from 100, the array of top three is empty, so we can just put 100, then 22 still can go there, 44 is gonna go between 100 and 22, I'm also keeping the top three in order. Then one is something we can ignore because we compare it with 144 and 22 and it's smaller than all of them. And finally, 120 is bigger than 100, so we shift everything, make space for it, and this is gonna be our top three. Now with this approach, if we have a very big N, so the number of items, and a small enough M, in this case three, this algorithm seems much better than just sorting everything. And there is, a, of course, a note that I have to make. Because here we are sorting number, I could have used sort and stable, which is much more efficient. But again, this is one of those things when you go into the rabbit hole and try to create the most generic and efficient solution ever. 
which is maybe a little bit of an excessive exercise, but I mean, you do advent of code just to have fun and explore different ideas. So how do we go and, and implement this particular algorithm? And I started by defining a very generic trait. So I said, okay, what if I want to define some kind of interface that is called top n, and it kind of allows us to define a function that is able to extract the top n numbers from somewhere, we will need to see what can implement this trait, and it gives us back a vector of u64. And as soon as I wrote this, I started to think, again, in very generic terms, why do I have to constrain myself to u64? Can this be more generic? And it's actually amazing that Rust supports generics. So here, what we can do is basically say, okay, let's make this generic over t, so any type, really. And then at this point, we can just do top n of any collection of t. Now at this point, okay, this is a cool trait, but how do we say to Rust, I want to implement this trait for all iterators, right? Because either tools did that, but I have no idea how they did it. It must be possible somehow, so let, let's try to figure it out. And it is possible, and it's something that in Rust is called blanket implementation. <laughs> so you can basically define a default implementation for a trait and specify to which types that implementation applies. And the syntax looks a little bit like this for our particular example, because we want to implement that trait for every iterator that produces items of type T. So the syntax is a little bit scary at first, or at least it was for me, so let's, let's try to distill it. Basically, what we are trying to say here is saying, we have two generic types, T and U. We are also constraining the type U to be an iterator, so something that implements the iterator trait, specifically producing items of type T. So it's also interesting to see that there is already a correlation between T and U. And finally, what we want to say is that now this implementation block works for every U. So we are basically saying every iterator that returns T, this implementation is gonna be available by default. Of course, it can be overridden, but if they don't override it, that's what's gonna be executed. Now, this implementation is not really that interesting. It's basically the algorithm I showed you before, but there are two lines that I want to highlight. The first one is this one, VEC with capacity, which is another thing that is very useful in advent of code, and in general, when you know the size of your vector in advance, or at least the maximum size, it might make sense to pre-allocate all of that memory in advance so that you avoid unnecessary resizing and reallocations of the vector. And this is just another trick that I discovered while doing more, more exercises of advent of code and benchmarking different solutions. So something to keep in mind because it could be useful in other projects. And then this other line is actually really interesting, not because I, I said so, but because the compiler told me, what the hell are you doing there? Like, I, I don't understand what this major symbol means for these particular types, because, of course, what we just said before is like, this needs to work for any T, but the concept of ordering, bigger or smaller, doesn't necessarily apply to any kind of value. So the way that we can work this around is by introducing an additional constraint saying T cannot just be anything, but it needs to be something that actually has a concept of bigger or smaller. So you can compare two different instances of that type and say this one is bigger than the other. At this point, Rust is actually very happy with that major. It knows what to do, and this implementation works. And the way we actually use this new um, iterator combinator that we just created, at this point, is we can just call it in our chain of iterator combinators. So we basically added this new functionality, and I was very proud when I realized that this was working. Okay, at this point, I, I started to uh, think a little bit more. Is this solution good enough? And I, I realized, okay, but I'm allocating a vector. Do I really need to do that? Is that really something that Rustachian should do if it's not necessary? Don't worry, you can probably do it, it's fine. But again, Advento Code is pushing you to to figure out what else can I do? How can I make this better? So basically what I wanted to do is replace this vector here with something else. And that something else is maybe an array because this is gonna be a fixed size. So why not just using an array? And if it's small enough, it can go in the stack. We don't need to do an allocation. And this is what I tried first and Rust was not happy with it. And 
yeah, on a second thought, it kind of makes sense. I'm defining a type, but I'm giving it a value. So this is not really how you do this thing in Rust. You need to define a proper type using types. So how do you actually tell Rust that you want to do an array, define a type for an array, which has a specific size that you don't know yet? And the way that you do that is by using const generics. And const generic is just a different kind of generics that allows you to provide a value that is known at compile time because it depends on how you actually use this particular trait in your code. And that value is gonna be used by the compiler to actually create the object of the right size. So in this case, we are saying, if I provide a value for n, that's gonna be the size that you can use for that particular array. Then the next issue was here. And here I'm kind of doing the opposite mistake. This is where I actually have to define an instance for that type, but I'm actually defining another type. So Rust is not happy. Like it's, it's expecting a value here, but it's actually finding a type definition. So the way that we fix this, it can be a little bit confusing because here the problem is like, we don't know what T is and we need to fill this array because Rust doesn't allow you to have arrays with just null in there, like null doesn't even exist. So how are we going to initialize this array? And one solution could be, we can use the default trait, which basically says for the type that you are using, take the default value and that's what, what you're gonna be filling the array with. So for numbers, this is gonna be zero. So if we are allocating an array with three numbers, we are basically creating an array that contains three zeros. And in order to do that, we of course need to constrain our type T even more because not every type has a concept of default. So we need to say, okay, this works only when you have a type that implements default. Now, the other thing is that I had to introduce here copy as well because the way that Rust creates this array is by creating an instance once, so it creates that default value once, and then it tries to copy it over to every single slot of the array, which is a little bit annoying because what if I want to implement this for a type that doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be copied, right? Maybe it's a very complicated struct with a lot of fields, you don't necessarily want that to be copied. So I figured out that there is actually one way to relax this constraint, and it's by using this helper function that is called core array from fn, which rather than taking a default value and copying it over, is basically allowing you to run a function for every single slot of the array, and in that function you can construct the object by yourself. And this is actually very convenient if you, have, if you want to initialize an array where the value depends on the index of that particular value, or in this case, when you want to avoid to use copy. Okay, a small note here, because you might have realized this already. This solution is not perfect. There are a few edge cases where it doesn't really work in the way it should. For instance, if you do a top n with 20 as a value, but you have less than 20 items in the array, you are gonna end up with a bunch of zeros, which don't make a lot of sense. Or another problem is that if you use negative numbers, you are gonna end up only with zeros, which is definitely the wrong answer. So I have actually a solution for this particular problem, which is kind of preventing these edge cases, but I'm not gonna go into that rabbit hole. I invite you to check it out in, in the repository and let me know if you can find a more elegant solution for these problems. Okay, now that we have defined this approach using const generics and we still have our, our iterator combinator, how do we actually use it? The syntax is a little bit different because this time, rather than passing that value three um, as, a, as an argument to the function, we need to pass it in the, to the type system. So we are basically using the TurboFish operator to say, this code needs to run assuming that the generic type there is actually three. So this works, we did it, I was really happy. And at this point I was like, okay, now which solution is faster? And we have the one with either tools, the one with the vector and the one with the array, which one do you think is faster? Any take? Okay, we have one, two, anyone say three? Okay, cool. Let's see. So actually there isn't a big difference to be honest, but surprisingly number three was a little bit faster than anything else. And again, this might be also my specific implementation. So don't take this as, as a generic rule. Do your own benchmarks and check out if also I'm doing something wrong or maybe slightly different implementation will give you very different results. 
I was using Cargo Bench, by the way, which is an awesome tool. So if you need to do benchmarks, it's probably what I would recommend, or at least the tool that I've used and I've been very happy with. Now, the next topic that I want to explore is what else can we do with const generics? Because it seems quite cool that you can do that, what we just did before, but does it apply only to that particular use case or can we use it in other use cases? And there is another exercise which is really interesting where you basically need to build a Conway game of life but on steroids because you have to do it 3D first and then 4D. So it's a little bit crazy. I, I have no idea how to picture that in my mind. But what I was sure about is that you need to have some way to define points in space where the number of dimensions is effectively something that you have to decide. It can be three, it can be four, and maybe you can even generalize that more. So what I did, I created this particular type where there is a const generic that defines the number of dimensions that this particular point can have. And then we can create a bunch of helper functions like for creating 2D points, 3D points, 4D points. And one thing that I discovered at this point is that the type inference in Rust is actually really, really good. And here, I don't even have to specify that value five because Rust is able to understand that from the size of the array that we are passing, which I think is quite impressive and it kind of helps you to write code that is a little bit more concise and where the typing system is not really slowing you down that much. There is another um, group of problems where const generics can be very useful. And very often in advent of code, you have to deal with grids. So you have to parse an input that is some kind of grid, like something like this. And uh, in your example code, the one that you get in the readme, that input might be very small because they are just trying to explain you the problem, what kind of things you need to do to solve that problem. But then when you look at the input that you have to parse, it is much, much bigger. So it would be nice to have a solution where I can generalize the size of the input so that I can test my code against the smaller input first and then against the, the actual input for the problem. And you can use const generics for that. Nothing is stopping you to use more than one const generic at the time. And here what I was doing, I was building a bi-dimensional grid where the width and height are variable and they are coming from the value that const generic is giving us. And with this approach, what I can do, I can create two functions. One is test readme, where I'm creating a grid that is much smaller than the one that I'm creating when I'm actually implementing the full solution to the problem. Now, another topic that I want to explore is parsing, because this is something that you end up doing a lot in advent of code. And actually in Rust, there are many different ways that you can do parsing. So I want to explore some of them. And another interesting ex exercise is this one, where in the input you have uh, like instructions for some kind of processor. And there are two kinds of instructions. One is mask and the other one is like a memory assignment. So when I was parsing this input, I thought, okay, I can create an enum and try to describe these two different possibilities as two different variants for this enum. So we have mask, which is gonna contain that value, that mask value as a string. And we have mem, which contains the memory address and the value that we want to assign. And of course, as I'm parsing the input, I'm gonna be able to create instances of instruction mask or instances of instruction mem. What, now, one way that you can implement this parsing is by implementing this trait called from str for the specific struct that we, we are working with here. And this trait is actually really interesting because it forces you to define an error type because when you are parsing, it's not necessarily guaranteed that you are able to parse that text into whatever you are trying to, to parse because of course it might not match the format that you are expecting. So of course this can fail and the trait is forcing you to think about the failure, which I think is something great to see in, in many Rust traits. Um, so then the way that we implement it is actually quite simple, so if it starts with mask, it's a mask type. If it starts with mem, it's a mem type. Otherwise, this is an error. We are finding a line that doesn't match our expectation. And uh, the way you use it is actually quite interesting because um, when you implement the from str, Rust gives you this dot parse that you can use on any string slice. So, it's kind of interesting that you have any string and at this point you can say dot parse and just define what is the type that you are expecting to get. 
and Rust knows what to do if you implemented that particular trait. But then I kind of realized I was doing a mistake again. I was doing unnecessary allocations because, of course, why should they allocate a new string for every single mask when I have this input already in memory? Maybe I can just take a slice of that string and use that in my struct. So basically what I'm thinking about is something like this, where now, rather than storing a string there in that particular variant, we keep a reference to the original input file. And of course, because this is a reference, we need to start dealing with lifetimes. So also I need to start introducing that lifetime into my particular type. Now let's try to update our from STR implementation with this new version of the struct. And at this point, the compiler unfortunately wasn't really happy with me. And it told me, I don't understand this signature anymore. It doesn't really match the signature that I was expecting for this particular trait. And my understanding of it is that because we introduced a lifetime, that lifetime doesn't match anymore with the signature expected by this particular trait. And I was looking into um, forums and Stack Overflow and eventually I ended up in this amazing conversation in the Rust um, community forum where they explained that actually this is unexpected behavior. And in these particular cases, rather than using from str, maybe you can use another trait, for instance, from. So this is what I try to do next. And from is a more generic trait that basically you can use not to convert from string to something, but basically to convert from anything to anything else. So you can basically define arbitrary conversions between types. So in this case, what I was doing is just saying, okay, my arbitrary type is a string slice with a specific lifetime. Let's implement this trait. And the implementation looks pretty much like the one before, but because we don't have an associated type for errors here, I was forced to do a panic here in case of errors. And I was a little bit anxious about this panic. It didn't feel right. So again, I started to question my code and what else should I be doing differently? And at that point, I realized that there is a variation of that trait that is called try from, which is effectively a fallible version of the previous trait. So anytime you, you are trying to do a type conversion that can fail, you should be implementing this trait and not the previous one. So again, I updated my implementation. In this case, we need to bring the trait into scope. And at this point, this implementation is almost exactly identical as the one we saw originally with the from string. Okay, so this one works, but the way we use it is a little bit different. This time, because we didn't implement the from str, but we implemented the try from, we cannot use dot parse anymore, but we need to use this try into, but it works exactly in the same way. So it's something that can give you either a, a success case or an error, so you basically get a result, and inside that result, you are gonna get the value that you were trying to parse if everything went well. Okay, now let's look at this other exercise where basically there is a list of sensors and for every sensor we also have a beacon and both things are identified by coordinates. So basically for every line we need to extract a couple of coordinates. So I, the first thing that I did, I defined a generic position struct with X and Y and then somehow I'm getting scroll bars but that should be readable. Then what I was doing for every line is taking the values from the text and for instance, here the position is 13 and two for the sensor, and here the position is 15 and three for the uh, beacon. Now, how do we parse this particular text? Of course, we can start to do splits at specific places. Uh, we can figure out how to slice things down depending on what we find in the text. But I was at the point where I said, okay, let me try to do a regex. So I went to regex 101, I wrote quickly a regex for this problem, I tested my input and it was more or less matching everything that I expected. So the next step is like, how the hell do I do regexes in Rust? I never did this before, so let me check the documentation. And this was all I got from the documentation. It's like nothing, you are on your own. Of course you are not on your own because then you look into other places and you end up here you realize that there is a crate that is like massively used. I think there were like millions of downloads. So this seems to be like the de facto way of doing regexes in Rust. But of course, being an external crate, you need to install it. And at that point, you can use it in your code. So I started to read the documentation, installed it, and started to use it. And I ended up with this code here. 
you need to import, of course, the regex uh, type from the crate. And then at this point, I was writing uh, only a more kind of smaller functions where my concern was only to parse one specific line. I didn't care about parsing the entire input in one go, but I wanted to parse one line. And for every line, I wanted to get back a tuple with two positions, the position for the sensor and the position for the beacon. So here I needed to define my regex and initialize it. And once we have a regex, by the way, here the cool thing is that you can use named capture groups, which is not a feature that every language has when it comes to regexes. So here I can actually call my groups x1, x2, y1, and y2, which I think is very convenient because you, it's easier to evolve that regex without breaking everything else. So the way that you get the capture groups, you say, okay, use this regex instance and try to capture this specific line. And at that point, if everything goes well, you have access to all the named capture groups and you can build your objects that way. Now, the next step is we need to process the entire input. So not just one single line, but a collection of lines. So you can use an iterator for that. And then for every uh, item, you can do a map and use our parse function. But there is a problem here, that we are reallocating the regex over and over for every single line. And that's probably something expensive. So is there a way that we can allocate objects globally and initialize them only once? This was my question, and I discovered another crate called lazy static, which does exactly what we want to do here. So basically, lazy static, you bring it into scope, it gives you a macro, and that macro allows you to define objects uh, for which you can get like a global reference and a code, a piece of code that is basically capable of initializing that object. And what happens is that at that point you can use this line regex constant, let's call it this way, in your code uh, everywhere, but that instance will be initialized only once the first time that you are actually using it. So this is exactly what we wanted to, to do. And we didn't need to change the rest of our code because at this point we can call the pass line function as many times as we want and it's gonna be using this global instance. But I heard somebody in the back saying, oh, you're using regexes, you solved one problem and now good luck with the new problems. Fair enough. So what, what can we do to, to not to use regexes? So I discovered this library called GNOME, but the idea is that you can do proper parsing Somebody is a fan of GNOME. And uh, I actually seen a lot of people solving advent of code by using this library just to do the parsing. And it gives you pretty elegant code for writing parsers. So I'm actually really liking a lot. But of course, it's an external crate. So it's something that you have to remember to install from Cargo. And then at that point, you can use it in your code. And to be honest, there is a little bit of a learning curve. So I'm not gonna try to give you a full blown tutorial on GNOME, but hopefully I can give you what is the principle for this library, the idea is that you have all your text that you're trying to consume. And by the way, it can be even binary, but here let's just talk about text. And what you want to do is that you, you have functions that can eat a little bit of that input. That's why it's called nom, because it's like munching the, the, the string. And what you are trying to do at every byte is basically say, okay, I'm gonna try to consume some amount of data from this input and come back with an actual object that I was able to parse. And with that idea, you are creating small functions that are capable only to parse a very specific type. For instance, in this case, I'm creating a function that is only capable of taking some input and from the current position of that input, try to consume an i64. And of course, this can also fail, so we have to return a result. But if it doesn't fail, what we return back to the user is the remaining string. So we might consume as much data as we want, but we have to return whatever is left and then the actual value that we were trying to parse, in this case, an i64. And the cool thing is that the library also gives you a lot of functions that are already built in, and all these functions are very easy to combine. For instance, here, what I'm saying is that I want to look for the minus sign, which, of course, might be there or might not be there. So I can use this opt, which is like optional, and tag, which is like an exact match in the text, to basically search in the input from the current position if there is a minus sign, I want to know about that. If there isn't, I'm gonna get an option that says it's currently not there. 
And there are other helpers, for instance, digit one is gonna allow you to consume um, characters that represents digits. There needs to be at least one and it's gonna keep going until it finds a character that is not a digit. So you can basically use all this function and you can then combine them to build your own parsers. Now, here I was parsing only i64s, but of course to parse my entire input, I need to do something a little bit more sophisticated and I'm using even more combinators to build these parsers. So again, there is a little bit of a learning curve, but I think it is worth it because then you will end up with code that is much nicer to work with, much more readable. And also if that fails, it's gonna tell you exactly where it failed as opposed to a regex that tells you, didn't match, good luck figuring out why. Okay, now I have this question again. Which solution do you think is faster? My first dummy regex implementation, the optimized regex implementation, or the one using GNOME? So number two, three, two, another one saying three. Nobody says one, you didn't like recreating regex over and over. <laughs> okay, good choice, let's, let's make this run. <laughs> and the results are quite overwhelming, so we need to zoom in a little bit. And it's still a little bit hard to tell like what's the order of magnitude because it didn't even fit my slide. So it's actually going over. So I'm gonna give you some numbers. And basically GNOME is like clearly the winner here to the point that it's like 417% faster than just using regexes. And I think this is probably because GNOME implementation is actually quite solid. But the idea is that if you do parsers consuming data bit by bit, you don't have the extra overhead of creating a regex, which is a state machine, and then doing all of that bookkeeping. So this is one more reason to explore this library because you apparently it can be much more efficient than other approaches. Now, there are a lot of other topics that I wanted to cover today. These are all things that I discovered in Rust while doing Advent of Code, but of course, I only have 45 minutes and I'm already over by one minute. So if you're interested in talking about any of this, please come to talk to me afterwards. So in conclusion, I think I started doing Rust in a very imperative way, but over time I kind of shifted more and more to a more functional approach. And while I was preparing these slides, I was looking at my solutions from three years ago and I was a little bit disgusted. I was like, I should have done this differently. But that's probably a good thing because it means that I'm learning new things, I have new ideas and I can try to do things in a different way now. The other thing that I observed is that because I had this project going for three years and every time I was working on new exercises, I was trying to update Rust, I also realized how the Rust ecosystem has evolved in the last three years. And I've been using tools like Clippy and Rust Analyzer, which I really recommend. And it was funny to see that every time I was doing an update of Rust, Clippy was firing and telling me, oh, by the way, did you know that you can improve this code? And this was sometimes because the language got new functionality, for instance, in the case of VecRetain, which kind of saved me from a lot of boilerplate code. And in other cases, it was just Clippy getting smarter and giving me uh, better advice on how to make my code better. And this is something that I've never seen in any other language, so I'm genuinely impressed that Rust gives us this kind of tools that are become kind of teacher for us. They can tell us, by the way, this code works, but there is a better way of writing it. So definitely really happy with Rust, really happy with Advent of Code. I think it's a brilliant combination. So if you are thinking to explore Advent of Code, I think I had personally a very positive experience and I can only recommend that. I have only one final remark, which is never stop learning because I'm coming from a background where I've seen a lot of languages. I've been working in the industry for a while. So I had a little bit of bias that I know what I'm doing. And then I started to explore Rust and I realized that there is an entire layer there which I didn't really know much about. And actually Rust as a language is helping me to explore all these concepts that coming from higher level programming language, I haven't had the fortune of exploring before. So never stop learning. And this is all I have for today. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have around 10 minutes or so for questions. So if anyone have any questions? Hopefully, hopefully Ferris is not gonna smash my laptop at this stage. Oh. Okay. Oh, Sorry, one second. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I just saw in one of your earlier um, 
solutions. You had VEC with capacity and swapped out for an array. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just trying to understand what exactly is the improvement there, because I thought with capacity was already quite good. Yeah, I, I think I was just trying to make, a, um, let's call it like a, an exercise of style in trying to figure out, can I avoid that vector allocation and use something else, just use an array? Now I'm not too sure if vectors can just be put on the stack. My assumption is that that's not the case. So that's why I started to explore a solution that was using arrays rather than uh, a vector. To be fair, it's definitely an unnecessary optimization for that particular problem because it's always gonna be three items in that particular problem. It wasn't really a variable that the problem was giving me. So again, it was more of an exercise in trying to figure out what if I have to do this at a different scale and maybe I want to avoid allocating a vector. Oh, one question at the front. Well, as a Clippy maintainer, I'm interested in what's your favorite and least favorite Clippy lint? Ooh, that's a good one. So uh, one that, I mean, I really like the fact that when there are new features, there, most often there are Clippy updates that kind of highlight the existence of that feature because it's not necessarily something that you are gonna immediately discover. Like you are not always reading all the release notes and figuring out, oh, did I actually use this and now can I do it this other way? So for instance, I've noticed when the, um, um, uh, the format string got the uh, possibility to have the name of the variable interpolated in the format string, that's something that Clippy got immediately, and like everywhere in my code, there were places where I could make that code a little bit nicer. I regret to inform you that Lint was uh, downgraded to Pedantic because Rust Analyzer was not working well with the inline format args yet. So. Oops. Okay, maybe that's my <laughs> least favorite thing about that. <laughs> cool. Any more Thank questions? You. Don't be shy. You can also ask questions about Node.js. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Oh, okay, one more question. So did your Rust experience actually um, go back basically to, to your node at JS? So did, do you think that this actually has impact on the way you write no, your node code now? That's a great question, thank you. I, I, I would say yes, but not just Node.js. I think in general, my idea of programming at least in two ways. One is that now I'm much more aware of like memory and I try to be careful on how I use memory with my code, which is something that coming from higher level programming languages, you never get used to worry about. It's like, it's fine, the garbage collector is gonna do it for you, just keep doing your stuff. And then you realize how in many places, even in simple code, you end up doing a lot of stuff that is not really necessary, just because kind of Rust gave you that, that mindset. Uh, so now I am much more conscious about that even when I write JavaScript or Python. The other thing is about errors. I really like the option type and the result type in Rust. So that idea of trying to avoid null as much as possible, I think is something that I'm carrying over also in Python and Node.js. And I see that my code, because of just thinking about that, is much more solid. I'm gonna prevent a whole category of bugs just by being more careful about that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. So is that all questions? All right, the next talk will be here at one. Oh wait, hang on, one more, one of the. Last minute question. Last question. <laughs> the hard one. Um, on the advent of code uh, problems, how long do you iterate on improving it and then before going on to the next one? Okay, that, that's a good question. So the, the, actually I think there are two kinds of people that do advent of code. The ones that do it competitively, so they don't really care about their solution. It's more, what's the fastest way that I can get a solution? Because every day there is kind of a global competition in whoever was the fastest to complete that exercise. So you want to compete for that particular uh, list of people. I was definitely not that kind of person. I, I am more, I'm just gonna do them whenever. Actually, sometimes I was doing them uh, in the following Christmas period. I was still doing the ones from the previous Christmas. So I was just taking the time that I wanted to take for every single exercise. Awesome. So, yeah, oh. don't really have a proper answer. It's more when I think it's ready, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Awesome. Well, um, next um, talk will be here at one o'clock. Before that, there is lunch. But one more final big round of applause for Luciano, please. Thank you.